you, Brian. All right, well, today we're going to uh, begin a series in the book of Esther, and uh, I always enjoy Esther. I, I've taught it a few times in, in a different setting than, than preaching, and I really enjoy the book. Uh, it has uh, all of the elements of, of a great uh, uh, play, if you will. We have good guys and bad guys and uh, intrigue and all sorts of things going on. And it's just a fantastic little book and it's only 10 chapters long. So I would encourage you uh, to read it uh, once a week. Just use it for your devotional reading. Uh, 10 chapters won't take you long at all and uh, you'll, you'll be blessed, I'm sure. Uh, now, now, I said Esther is my favorite book, or one of my favorite books, but do you know that when they were developing the canon of Scripture, Esther almost didn't make it into our Bible? And, and let me explain that word canon, because we, we tend to use jargon words and sometimes people don't understand it. So, see, canon I'm talking about has one end, not two. Okay? The one I'm talking about actually has a bigger bang. Uh, than the one that uses the gunpowder and thing. And the canon, the reason they call this the canon of scripture is because it's, it's just, it comes from the Greek word canon, which means a measuring rod or something that will accurately uh, measure something. So the scriptures are what we measure everything against. We measure our ideas against Scripture. We, we measure our uh, attitudes against Scripture, so on and so forth. But so when they were putting this canon together, uh, there was a, a lot of objection to including the book of Ex Esther. Now you may say, well, why is that? Who would object? Well, the objection is based on the simple fact that God is nowhere mentioned in the book of Esther. The only book in the, in, the, in the canon of Scripture that doesn't mention the name of God. Now, we may think, well, that's a little odd because isn't the Bible all about God? Yes, it is. But I think the fact that God isn't mentioned in this book is the very point of the book. The point of Esther, I believe, is that God is working in our lives, in our society, even when he is not visible. Even when he is not mentioned, even when we may doubt he's there, he is there and he is working. Now, we that live in the Northwest should be able to, to grasp that concept easily because there are many times when we go for days, weeks, maybe even months without seeing what? The sun. It rains a lot. <laughs> but do we ever doubt that the sun is up there doing his work, rising and setting, uh, taking care of our atmosphere and all those things that the sun does? Of course we don't. We know he's there even though we can't see him. And that's the point of the book of Esther. So let me ask you a question. If that's the point, what is the theme of the book of Esther? Now, some people might say, well, well, the theme, obviously, it's a story about Esther. No, it's not. Esther is a player in this pageant, but it is not a story about Esther. Let me suggest some themes for you uh, that really uh, give us the idea of what Esther is all about. Esther is the story of two kingdoms. It's the story about the kingdom of a powerful ruler by the name of Ahasuerus who rules over the Persian Empire. And then it's a story about our Lord Jesus Christ who rules over his kingdom. Therefore, it's the story of two kings, Ahasuerus and Jesus. And as we go through, we're going to see them compared and contrasted. It's a story about redemption. As we get into the story, if you're not familiar with it, you, you will, we will come to the part where the king makes a decree that all of the Jews in the land can be killed. And that's a very real possibility they face. But unnamed, unseen, God intervenes and redeems those Jews. Just like he's doing in our lives. He has redeemed us by dying on the cross, forgiving our sins. 
We didn't see it happen. We didn't feel it happen. But we know it happened. It is the story, Esther is, of the powerful and the powerless. Ahasuerus has all the power in the world. He's the most powerful man alive. The Jews have no power. They're foreigners in a foreign land. And we'll talk about how they got there here in a minute. But they're, they're captives. They're slaves. Now they have no say in anything. They have no vote. Ahasuerus has all the power. And finally, it's a story about us. It's a story about everyday people living their lives in a foreign land about everyday people having to conform to laws that they, they may not have, well, they absolutely didn't have any say in their making. We often wonder where God is in these times. It's interesting to me, the Jews now, our story takes place in, in the, the mid 400s BC it's been a thousand years since the Exodus okay the Jews look back to that time of the Exodus and can't you imagine that they long for those days when miracles were happening when God was showing up on mountaintops when Moses and God were dividing the, the Red Sea and all of that and God is delivering his people from the Egyptians. Don't you suppose that the Jews were saying, well, if God could deliver our ancestors from the Egyptians, why can't he deliver us from the Persians? I can see them asking that question. Of course, we know they pose the question wrongly. It's not that he can't. More accurately, they should ask, why hasn't he? Or why won't he? Well, you've probably asked that question yourself at some point in your life. If God is all-powerful, if God loves me so much, why doesn't he fix this or that or whatever it is that we're struggling with? And yet God is silent. It's a question that is common to humanity. Why doesn't God fix my situation? Why doesn't God fix my country? Why doesn't God fix his world? And the answer is an emphatic, I don't know. That's God's business. But I do know this. God is working. God is alive. God is well. And we can say with a hymn writer, because God is well, all is well with my soul. Well, let's look and see what we can find here. A little background about Esther, in case you're, you're not up on all, all this history. Um, let, let me read the first uh, three verses for you again, just to kind of refresh. Now, in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces. In those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal th throne in Susa, the capital, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Medea and the nobles and the governors of the provinces were all before him. That's a party. The Persian army and the army of Medea. You're talking over a million men just in the Persian army. Then you throw in the Median army and all these governors, all these people. Now this is the kind of power and wealth that Ahasuerus wielded. He could do these kinds of things. So how did they get there? Uh, in Daniel chapter 1 verse 1 and 2 and, and let me say before we go on there's something in, in, that makes scripture con confusing to folks if you don't understand it if you begin in Genesis and you read all the way through to the end of Esther you have a, a historical chronological timeline everything you read after Esther is something that happened back during that time 
And that can be confusing if you don't realize that. So when we uh, shoot ahead several books to Daniel, we're reading about something that happened before the writing of Esther. Now, having said that, let me read here the first two verses in Daniel. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, and with some of the vessels of the house of God, he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels of the treasury of his God. Now, what does that have to do with anything? Well, this is a, a few years before uh, Esther. In fact, this is 605 BC and Esther takes place in the 400s. So, Nebuchadnezzar comes, besieges Jerusalem. Now, he's Babylonian, okay? Uh, prior to this, the Assyrians had, had wiped out Israel, Jerusalem's in Judah. Now when the Assyrians came and they invaded and they took over your land, they killed you. That's what they did. They weren't interested in captives, they just killed you. So that was bad news when you heard the Assyrians were coming. So we're done with the Assyrians though, now we have the Babylonians coming. And the Babylonians had a little different idea about what to do when they took over a country. They would go in and they would take what they considered the cream of the crop of the population. They would take the, all the educated folks and the, the artisans and the craftsmen and they would take them back to Babylon with them. And then they would use them as servants and slaves. That's how Daniel got there. You're probably familiar with, with that story. Well, then what happened is the, the Persians came along and conquered the Babylonians. And the Persians thought like the Babylonians about captives. So they brought these people to Persia. And that's how the Jews got there. But they, they bring them there and they are totally powerless. Uh, they are not in any way, shape, or form uh, given any kind of authority or uh, the ability to do anything about their plight. So now we move up here uh, to 538 BC and that is what has happened. They've been demoralized and, and now we come to 483 BC when the book of Esther actually takes place. Now think about it. The, the point of moving these people like this uh, was to do a couple of things. It was to one, hopefully have them assimilate into thinking like the country that captured them. And the other was to demoralize them so they wouldn't have any grandiose ideas about rebelling. Now, it has been 122 years from the time they got there until now. Life expectancy in those days was a whopping 30 years. So that means that four generations have passed between the time they were brought to Persia and what we are reading now. So think about it. Again, they've been there for four generations. Uh, people have got to be demoralized. They've got to be wondering, well, where is God? Uh, why is he dragging this thing on? What, what's going on with us? The people are languishing in limbo. Now, we have been talking about a fellow named Ahasuerus, right? And Ahasuerus is the king of Persia. But I'm going to, and some of your Bibles will probably use this name. Ahasuerus is his Hebrew name. It translates into to the Greek and comes out a name that you're probably all for, more familiar with anyway. And that name is Xerxes. Okay? Same guy. So you're, some translations say Xerxes, some translations say Ahasuerus. Yeah. Who's right? They're both right. Okay? Now, why do you know about Xerxes? At least this Xerxes. There were more than one. But why do you know about this one, even if you've not read the Bible? What? 300. Yeah, 300 Spartans. Remember the movie, The Battle of Thermopylae? Well, this is the Xerxes. And that battle is going to take place about three years after the book of Esther is over. Now, if you saw the movie, you saw all the armies of Persia coming along, and, and, and that's pretty much the way it was. Uh, uh, 
Ahasuerus or Xerxes, if you will, uh, had that kind of power. In fact, uh, a guy by the name of Ian Duguid, I hope I didn't massacre his name too bad, says this about Ahasuerus. I, I thought this was a pretty good way of putting it. He says, Ahasuerus is no teacup tyrant. He ruled 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia, from sea to shining sea. And that's the guy we're talking about. The Xerxes of the 300 Spartans. Now, the historians argue with themselves all the time, but this army that Xerxes mounted uh, to go against uh, the Spartans, uh, they estimate the size of that. The, the most conservative estimates are 150,000, and then they range up to a million plus. Either way, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of army. And that's what this guy commanded. Now you're living under him. Now we complain about our government, or at least I do, and I think most of you do. You know, like, well we gotta do this, we gotta do that, the government's into my business too much, blah blah blah, and on and on we go. And that's fine, but think about it if we were living under a guy like Xerxes. And he's making the rules. And you better not complain about it. That'd be tough, I would think. I would think we'd be crying out to God saying, where are you? Well, let's see a little bit what life was like under Ahasuerus. This covers the rest of the first chapter, and I'm not going to read it all, but I'll, I'll get the high points for you. One of the first things we see is the king's values, which stand in stark contrast to our king's values. Uh, we saw the party he threw. And what's, the, what's that all about? It's about, hey, look at me. I'm the king. Look at the kind of party I can throw. Look at what I can do. Look at how powerful I am. Uh, then we have, in verses 6 and 7, we have all the fine linen, the silver, the mosaic. The drinks were served in golden vessels of different kinds. The royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. Hey, look at me. And who paid for all of this? Ultimately, the people. He would tax the people. He would spend their tax money. Now, what about our king? How does he operate? We pay no taxes, and he lavishes us with everything he has. Quite a difference, isn't there? The earthly king takes from his subjects and spends it on himself. Our heavenly king gave his life for his subjects and spends eternity lavishing us with his love and his care. Quite a difference. One uses people to enrich himself. The other lavishes his riches on the people. The difference between Xerxes and Jesus. In the Persian Empire, regulation had run amok. Now here's something you need to know. This would make a good book on leadership too. Uh, about leaders. A weak leader... A leader that sees himself as incompetent. Or a leader that thinks he's competent and isn't competent. One thing he has to do is he has to control his environment. The weaker he is, the more he is going to try to control his subjects. Because he always has this nagging fear that if I let them get out of control... My weakness will be known, and I may be overthrown. Now you scale that down to our interpersonal relationships. It's the same way. If you're in a position of leadership, if you feel like you have to control every aspect of those people that you lead, or that person you lead, you are a weak leader. Now, see, some people may say, well, he's a strong leader, or she's a strong leader because she makes everybody toe the line when just the opposite is true. Because we have the kingdom of this world and we have the kingdom of God. And we're going to see how this works out. Regulation had run amok. Every detail of life, if you were in the Persian Empire, was regulated. 
And we see it here in the party right down to how much you could drink and how you drank. And see, he says right here in verse 8, and drinking was according to this edict or this law. There is no compulsion, for the king had given order for all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. So there was some edict that regulated how much you could drink, and now he passes an edict that says for this party, let it all go. Just drink all you want. Have a good time. But even that, even the good time, was regulated by the government. As, as I was uh, reading some of the commentaries, getting ready for this, they, they brought up this crazy law uh, that they passed in, in England here a few years ago. And it regulated bananas. Now, now here's, here's some bureaucracy for you. In this law, it actually regulated how much curvature a banana could have and still make it into the store as an approved banana. We think this is kind of, you know, uh, new to our age where government tries to regulate every move we make. Government has always tried to regulate every move you make with the exceptions of when there, the few times when there really was a strong government. And then they did not do that. Even the drinking in the party must conform to the law. Now you contrast that to Christ's kingdom. And what does Christ's kingdom look like? How, how much regulation is there in Christ's kingdom? In Romans chapter 6 verse 14 he says, You are not under the law, but you are under grace. Okay. Um, years ago, 30 years ago, whatever it was, I, I went to a youth conference. And the guy that was speaking was a nationally known youth leader. And he said, one of the things I do sometimes that just causes parents to almost have a heart attack is at the end of my message, I tell the kids, these are Christian kids now, that you can now go forth and do whatever it is you want to do. And the parents just go, <laughs> you know. Well, his point is, you're under grace. You're saved by grace. You're kept by grace. You're constrained by the Holy Spirit, if indeed you are a Christian. Therefore, you can go and do whatever you want to do. That's a lot different than every aspect of your life is now regulated. Well, the party goes on. Verses 10 and 12. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Bitsa, Habana, and all those other guys that are hard to pronounce to bring... <laughs> See, people ask me how to pronounce these Hebrew, Hebrew words. That's how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> you just you nail a couple of them and just say all the rest of them. <laughs> or you can do it this way. Pronounce them any way you want. Just do it with authority because nobody knows how to pronounce them anyway. <laughs> And they'll think you're really smart. So anyway, he asks all his advisors, and he tells them to bring the Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. Hmm. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, delivered by the eunuchs, and this, the king became enraged and anger burned within him. Wow. Wow. This is a, a problem. Now, Xerxes has been drinking for all these days. So he does what people often do when they've been drinking too much. He does something stupid. Now, it's stupid. Do you have this big party and you're going to call your wife to come and show her off to all the guys? That's just doesn't strike me as a, as a wise thing to do. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting to me I, I, in, in Ephesians 5.18 where it says, be not drunk with wine but filled with the Spirit. You know, they're contrasting the two because when you're drunk with wine, your mind is warped, controlled by the alcohol. Well, when you're filled with the Spirit, your mind is also warped, but it's warped in the good direction and is controlled by the Spirit. So I've coined this little phrase, and I say this, when you're drunk with wine, you say stupid things. 
and you do stupid things. When you're drunk with the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit, you say spiritual things, and you do spiritual things. So be controlled by the Spirit, not by the wine. So here he is, he's, he's all drunk, and he says, go get my wife, bring her here. I want to show her off. He sees his wife as simply a possession, as a thing as a trophy wife, if you will. He doesn't love her. He loves the fact that he has her and he wants to show her off and brag about it a little bit. Now compare that to what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 about how husbands in God's kingdom are supposed to act differently than husbands in a Hazarus kingdom or the kingdom of this world. God says, in my kingdom, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. In man's kingdom, all too often it is use your wife and get whatever you can get out of her. Totally different concepts, aren't they? Now, I know there, there are gradations in between there. But men, as Christians, we want to make sure we're over here in God's camp, loving our wives. So you see, now, now you're still the head of the household. I understand all that. But in God's kingdom, the ruler serves those he rules over. In man's kingdom, the ruler is served by those he rules over. You see the difference? Quite a difference in the two kingdoms. And we're going to see this all the way through the book of Ruth. In fact, chapter 1 ends with, and sometimes I hear Christians quote this verse, and I think, boy, you're stupid. Here's what they say. Here's what 22 says. He sent letters to the royal provinces, that is Xerxes, to every province in its own script and to every people in its own language, and and said that every man be master of his own household. Whoa, that's pretty cool. Every man is supposed to be master of his own household. The only problem is when Christians quote that, they don't, they don't quote it saying this is what Xerxes said. They quote it as if that's what God said. And God didn't say that at all. He said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So, two different kingdoms, two different kings, always at odds with one another. Well, next we see how truly powerless, though, the powerful often are. It's always fun to watch when things catch up with them. So, Xerxes is the most powerful on, man on earth with his million-man army. He says, go bring the queen to me. And so they go and they tell the queen, hey, the king has commanded your presence, and she says, no. How can this be? <laughs> Horror of horrors. The most powerful man in the world can't control his wife. <laughs> yeah. She says, no. The law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked, could nonetheless be refused. The king could not control a mere woman, his wife. The most powerful man in the world is shown to be powerless in his personal life. You see, that's why weak leaders have to control everything. Because if they can't, they feel like their weakness is showing. Well, what happens when you feel like you have to control something, and all of you have felt like you had to control something at some point in your life probably, some situation, some, some person, some something. Well, what happens? Never works, does it? Because there's only one person on this earth you can control. And that's yourself. And some of us struggle with that. Well, what happens is we become frustrated. We become frustrated, then we become angry. 
And we see here that that's exactly what Xerxes has done. Now, now in a fit of anger, he turns to his advisors and he says, what shall we do? What shall I do? And they say, according to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus delivered by the eunuchs? Then Mimikon said in the presence of the king and the officials, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the people who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. A couple of things going on here. Weak leaders always surround themselves with weak advisors. We know them as yes men. They do not surround themselves with competent men and then listen to them. Because again, in their eyes, they see themselves, if, if I take your advice, I'm being weak. So I surround myself with a bunch of advisors. Doesn't matter to me if they're competent or incompetent, as long as they're going to build me up and always tell me I'm right. Where a strong leader surrounds himself with competent individuals who will challenge him when they, they think he's off base. And it won't make him angry. You see the difference. Well, Ahasuerus here had surrounded himself with a bunch of weak leaders, a bunch of yes men. So the first thing they want to do is they have to escalate this thing into a national crisis. So you see, it's not just the queen has disobeyed you. It's the queen has disobeyed Persia. The whole land is going to fall apart now because the queen said no to you. And all the women in the land are going to rebel against their husbands because the queen said no to you. Well, was that true? Of course not. But, you, you, you know, you need to make a new law, you have a crisis. And you want to look strong, you create a crisis, so you can solve that crisis. And that's exactly what these weak advisors are advising their weak leader to do. Yes, men. Horror of horrors, the queen said no. Now, notice they claim that their motives are pure. In verse 20 and 21. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all the kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands and low alike. This advice pleased the king, and the princes and the king did as Mimikun said. They always claim this is for your good. We're only doing this because we know what's good for the land. So you may have reservations, but that's okay. Just tuck them away in your back pocket. Don't speak up. Don't stand up. Don't make waves. It's for the greater good. Well, what can we learn from all this? I think three things stand out to me. One, not to take the power and the glory of this world too seriously. There was never a man more powerful than Ahasuerus, and yet in his personal life he was powerless. We look at kingdoms, we look at power structures, and we say, oh my goodness, what's going on? What's going to happen? It's okay. Because they're all going to pass away. And God's kingdom will stand. We, as Esther, live in a society that re routinely elevates the trivial. Don't we? We have whole magazines dedicated to TV shows or and various things. We pay multi-million dollar salaries to people for kicking a ball or catching a ball or whatever they want to do with a ball. Now I like sports, don't get me wrong. But the money we lavish on it is silly. But we, as a society, we elevate the trivial. 
And when we elevate the trivial, the truly important kind of fades into the background. Our self-worth all too often is measured by the car we drive. If that's the case, pray for me, because I'm in a deep depression. <laughs> My almost 20-year-old Thunderbird. <laughs> you know, we're more, we're more interested in where you went to school than what you learned in school. The empire of this world, my friends, is oftentimes nothing more than a glittering hologram. And it will soon disappear because it has no real substance. Second, chapter 1 shows us that sometimes, and this is the part I don't like, sometimes we have to wait to see what God is doing. I don't know about you, but I don't like waiting. I want it now. If I wanted it tomorrow, I'd wait till tomorrow to order it. I want it now. In this first chapter, there's no mention of Esther anywhere. There's no mention of our hero Mordecai. He hasn't showed up on the scene yet. And as we said throughout the whole book, there's no mention of God. But all these folks are there, especially God. But events are still moving according to God's good pleasure. None of these events, so we should note, would have seemed significant to the Jews in Susa at the time. Big deal. The king's throwing another party. Big deal. The king banishes the queen. That's just everyday life in Persia. Has no effect on the Jews whatsoever. Ah, but wait. The end of the story has not yet been told. God is putting the pieces in place to redeem his people. I like what Paul says in Philippians 1.6. He says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion I didn't finish, did I? People often don't finish at the day of Jesus Christ. We may have to wait until the day we step into eternity for everything to be right with our lives. In fact, we can change that. We will have to wait for everything to be right with our lives. You know? But it will be. That's the thing we can hang on to. And third, God's kingdom is not like the kingdoms of this world. The book of Esther is one of comparisons. The Lord Jesus is the great king whose decrees cannot be changed or challenged. We see that the great king of Persia's decrees could be changed and challenged. In Daniel chapter 4 verse 35, I'm going to start at verse 34. That's what it says about our God. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I, I have that part underlined. His reason returned to him. When he could reason correctly, he had a correct view of who God is. And I blessed the Most High God and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are astonished counted as nothing and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say to him what have you done it's pretty good Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 9 verse 20 who are you and he's I'm sure he says it sarcastically just like that says, who are you O oh man to question God or some versions say to answer back to God you know? And you think about it. Who are we to question God and question what he's doing? Unlike the self-serving Ahasuerus, God uses his power for our benefit. You know, Paul tells us, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now he's talking ultimately. It may, we may not see that it's good, 
We may think it's bad. It may even hurt at the time. But ultimately, to those who love God and are called according to His purpose, it will work for our eventual good. And one day, just as Ahasuerus called for Vashti, Jesus will call us. He will call us to step into His presence, to join Him at His banquet, as His bride. But it will not be the same as Ahasuerus. It will not be to shame us, to use us as objects of His good pleasure, but it will be to declare that we are His bride, we are His beloved, and we are invited to His banquet table. It will not be so He can use us. It will be so that He can lavish us with His grace and His love and His mercy. And we'll finally know the full extent of that. So what will you experience? What will your experience be like on that day when He calls? There are only two options. Banishment or banquet. Those that know Jesus Christ as Lord and the Savior will be invited and admit, admitted, admitted to the banquet. Those who do not know Him will be banished from the banquet forever. And only you know where you fit. You're in one of those two places. There's no in-between. So I would just encourage you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, now is the time. The communion time is probably the most appropriate time we have for making that decision. So I would encourage you, as uh, the men come up, to begin thinking about that. Where am I in relation to the great King, Jesus Christ? Am I a part of his kingdom? Will I be called as his beautiful bride? And if you're unsure, settle it. You can do it in the quietness of your heart. Say, Jesus, I need you as my Lord and Savior. I want to be filled by your Holy Spirit, controlled by your Holy Spirit. You are the kind of king I want to live under. Make sure you're right. And if you already know him, just think about where you are in relation to Him. Make sure that you're right. You can't lose your grace, you can't lose your salvation, but you can certainly lose your joy and not enjoy your salvation. So if you have something going on in your life that you need to let go of, this is the time. Pray with me. Father, thank you for uh, the book of Esther and the wonderful story it tells. And uh, be with us as we journey through it and help us to continually see the difference between being in your world and being in a man's world. And Lord, as we take communion this morning, pierce our hearts. Lord, for those of us that know you, let us examine ourselves and make sure we're right with you. And if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, let them examine themselves and ask for entrance into your kingdom knowing that the moment they ask it's a done deal we ask these things in jesus name amen